morning. Hello. Hello, everybody in this room. Hello, everybody watching us online. My name is Maria Nomiku. I'm leading British Council's work on youth skills and schools in Europe. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to this event, which is part of our Stronger Together program uh, at the British Council. Stronger Together is a youth leadership program that aims to bring young people closer to stakeholders, policymakers, academia, enterprises, civil society, to discuss about issues that are important for all of us, for our present and for our future. Stronger Together has four strands. So we focus on social cohesion, on climate, gender equality, and digital skills. And this particular event is part of this last strand on digital skills, aiming to find out how young leaders can use artificial intelligence for the common good, solving problems that are social or environmental, but important, as I mentioned, for all of us. Uh, before we start, I would like to give, uh, um, I would like to thank very much all the partners and all the people that have worked for this event and for all the, this project so far. We started with focus groups with the young people. We organized hackathons in three countries, in Greece, in Hungary, and in Cyprus. We worked with uh, research centers in these three countries and with experts, and I will mention them in a second. Uh, and the winning teams of these hackathons are here in London with us, um, in the audience, you, like people online cannot see them, but you will hear them afterwards sharing recommendations and asking questions to the speakers. So it is really great that these hackathons uh, allowed us to finally find this group of young people, bring them here to London to meet different organizations, institutions, enterprises about uh, working on artificial intelligence for the common good. So first of all, I would like to thank the UNESCO International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence that worked with us from the very beginning. They curated um, this event. They helped us with the focus groups. They helped us with very, very useful advices. And it, um, I would like to particularly thank Davor Orlitz, who was really the person working with my team from the beginning. Thank you very much. Big thank you goes to, to the trainer, to the person that was behind the three hackathons, provided the platform, provided with trained the trainers, the content of the hackathons, Mike Lloyd, who is also here from Levintech company, and worked directly with three uh, innovation and research centers in the three countries. Athena Innovation and Research Center in Greece, that provides us with a lot of expertise, with mentors that work closely with the young people, Science Center of Excellence in Cyprus and Mom Innovation Center in Hungary. Uh, great teams, great partners. We, we would never be able to organize these events without them. And finally, I want to thank my colleagues that worked on this project from the beginning. My colleague Irini Careta, um, who was the manager of Stronger Together until now, and she's moving to a, a new fantastic role. Victoria Kiljaki from Greece. Uh, Marilena Kitaku from Cyprus and Dina Tarzan from Hungary. Um, I will stop here. I think uh, we have uh, really a lot to discuss, so I really don't want to um, speak more. I would like to pass the floor directly to our moderator, Dr. John Shaw Taylor, who is a UNESCO Chair in Artificial Intelligence, Professor at University College London and Director of the Center for Computational Statistics and Machine Learning. Uh, thank you, Maria, and, and thank you for the invitation to be participate in this event. It's a, it's a wonderful event to be involved in. Um, I should mention I'm also uh, the director of the International Research Center uh, on Artificial Intelligence, which Maria mentioned, which is based in Slovenia, uh, and for which Davo has been uh, coordinating the, uh, the hackathon and helping with the organization of this uh, Stronger Together event. I think the Event, a, a wonderful opportunity to try to break some of the misunderstandings around AI, build a better uh, appreciation of what it isn't, but also what it can do and what it has the potential to do, and where we can uh, really see that benefit reach much more broadly 
than perhaps is happening through uh, commercial development. So I believe these uh, thinking about AI beyond the commercial, but uh, thinking about the ways it can actually help humanity in more positive ways than perhaps some of the things that are happening uh, in the commercial world, I think is a, is a great uh, opportunity and we should be really focusing on, on that. And that's certainly the focus that the uh, AI center that I mentioned in Slovenia and also uh, of course as an educational institution uh, UCL is involved heavily in uh, education uh, around AI, along with traditional AI research at UCL. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to kick off the event, uh, the discussion. Uh, the initial uh, part will be presentation by the panelists of themselves mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit of uh, their thoughts on the Stronger Together program and the recommendations that the, uh, the hackathon winners have, have been working on. Of course, we're going to have a detailed discussion of those uh, following on, but just initial thoughts would be very interesting. So I'll just go in the order that they are on this list. So if I could ask Jack Watson to begin. Hi, morning, everyone. My name is Jack Watson. I'm at Skills and Workforce. Technology. Uh, so my job is to make sure the UK has the AI skills and talent it needs. Which is economic um, so where do that eventually got those right policies in place so that we have a sustainable pipeline of diverse AI talent? And that's everything from school all the way through to education at Pipeline, but also making sure that the people who are in work today are able to upscale and reskill in AI. Um, a couple of things I think, oh wait, I won't, I won't go into recommendations too much, so I know we're going to talk about that later. A couple of things that are really important to me in my role is like diversity, making sure that the AI workforce uh, is diverse, so that leads to innovation and also brings bias to the thing that people talk about in the And also making sure that we're intervening early enough mm -hmm. in my and some of the things they talk about data literacy, it's really important we build those sorts of skills early so that um, in, in children when we can. Uh, a little bit about sort of some of the things government's doing. Uh, the higher education level can probably be AI based on conversion courses, which are master's courses that we help create with universities which suit for students from non STEM backgrounds to upskill in AI. So these sorts of initiatives, again, diversity, increasing the work. Broadening the pipeline to make sure as many people can be involved in, in uh, the hour. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, actually, I would now turn online um, if I can with yeah. the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and ask Jim uh, Dratia, who's uh, from the European Commission and Secretary General of the European Commission International Dialogue and Ethics and Bioethics. Jim. Many thanks, John, uh, and many thanks to you, Maria, uh, to the whole organizing team, really, for, for making this happen. It is a, a tremendous pleasure and honor to be with you um, and responsibility deeply felt regarding this crucial set of issues. Artificial intelligence, so many possibilities. Um, and so, with regard to the ethics and governance, um, a crucial question to reflect upon is this, what world? What mm -hmm. world do we want to live in together? Oh, wait, uh, sorry, uh, the connection is good, but I'm not sure, did I say we? I think I did. Yeah. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it, it's fine, it, it can happen. Um, it's just that whenever that happens, we need to pause a moment, pause for thought and reflect on Mm, who is in the we and who is not? And how is that determined? Um, and then really this other key ethical question, who are the others? Um, ethics is about inquiring into the question of the good, of the just, the fair, the, the right. And ethics is also about um, perplexity and, and reframing. I've been asked to tell you just a little bit about myself, 
about how I came to take up the role I, I have in, in this field. Um, my first degree was in physics at Imperial College, not far from where we are gathered uh, today. Um, and my first research was on neural networks and artificial intelligence that was um, over 20 years ago. Um, after degrees in philosophy, environmental sciences, a PhD in political philosophy and a PhD in socioeconomics of innovation, um, I had the great good fortune to get a Fulbright scholarship, um, do research at uh, Harvard at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, um, started working as a professor in Brussels, professor of uh, philosophy, science and technology studies and ethics, and then was asked to start working at the European Commission and then to become a member of the Bureau of Policy Advisors to the President of the European Commission, advisor on ethics, science, and new technologies. And, and that is how in 2016, at the present request, I initiated the work at the Commission on the Ethics and Governance of Artificial Intelligence. It started small and it has now become huge because it is hugely important. Um, and so we have already really a, a, robust, a, a robust legal framework in, in, in place with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, as an important component. And then in the last years, a remarkable set of complementary acts, notably the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and then um, watch this space, work in progress, exciting the AI Act. Um, all of this navigating a number of interesting generative tensions, which we can discuss further later on, um, how to foster innovation for good and at the same time, foster fundamental rights, how to have legislation which is pertinent in this and that specific sector for this and that specific tech and application and use case, and which at the same time is one size fits all. And in fact, we're seeing this played out with the questions raised most recently by, by Chad GPT and other general-ish purpose AI, and generative AI models. Um, to, to close this very short introductory uh, set of remarks, in thinking about the ethics and governance of AI, it is crucial to go beyond just data protection and privacy. Um, and this is, you know, this is what the recommendations that you have produced uh, beautifully demonstrate. So not just uh, looking at how to make this and that tech acceptable and trusted at the end of the pipe, uh, but really questions around education, around culture, questions of justice, sustainability, and solidarity. Questions as to the political economy of AI and the business models themselves. Not only risks and costs and benefits, but also the distribution thereof. And ultimately, what we need to ask and to carefully, collectively address don't forget what world, what world do we want to live in together? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn now to Emily Newmas, Professor of Computer Science at uh, UCL. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Emily Newmas. Uh, I'm a Professor of Computer Science at UCL as well as an Amazon Scholar uh, at Amazon. So I've been working closely with researchers both in academia and in the industry. And uh, it's, first of all, it's great to be here and to see all of the recommendations by the youth because it, the, the, these are, I believe that the topics identified are really important. And I'm not going to get into details about my opinion about it because I guess we'll be talking about this later. But uh, some of my recent work related to the topic today is, it involves, for example, developing uh, tools uh, to access open educational resources. AI-based tools, where uh, one of the final goals of the project was to democratize access uh, to education by underprivileged uh, countries, for example, underprivileged students. And uh, other recent work uh, of mine includes uh, evaluating fairness and bias in online information retrieval and access systems, such as search engines, where, as you know, the society, basically most of us, are using these type of tools in order to access information and uh, learn about what's happening in the world. So if they are biased, the opinion of the society and the way people think will be highly biased and we really have to care about the type of uh, algorithms, AI algorithms that are being used and to ensure that they are fair and they represent different types of opinions. 
So how do you counter quantify bias and how do you ensure that these systems are unbiased and they have proper correct and unbiased information to the users? That's been a focus of my distance research. And finally, some of the recent work that uh, we have been doing is regarding uh, certification of bias by uh, companies. As you know, lots of companies recently are using or switching to usage of AI-based methodologies for decision making. And uh, we as customers of these companies, we don't have any control and quite often we don't know what these algorithms do. And sometimes deliberately, possibly deliberately or undeliberately, these algorithms could be biased because the data may be biased or the algorithms themselves may be introducing some sort of bias. But at the moment, uh, there is not there is some focus by the, by the industry and of course governments as well in terms of regulating uh, this type of bias. But uh, one of the things that we have been working on is uh, developing external auditing mechanisms, data sets and evaluation methodologies. Uh, for quantifying and possibly certifying bias uh, in AI systems using decision making by these companies. I believe these are some of the uh, teams that are already identified, it looks like, by the team, uh, by the youth, which is great to see. And I, I think we'll discuss, get into more details about that this year. But thank you very much. Thank you, Mene. Um, we look forward to hearing more uh, on those topics. Uh, and finally, I would ask James Bridge, who's the Chief Executive of the UK National Commission. Alimera, and congratulations to you because it's a remarkable achievement and your recommendations are great for what we're going to do today. Um, a really interesting thing about UNESCO is that it was formed to build defences of peace in the minds of people, because after the Second World War, people realized you needed a lot more than just money and defense to bring people together and to create connection. connection. And that's exactly the thing that we're doing today, but in a new way. But people haven't changed, but the technology has. Also, as part of this global network, I just wanted to bring greetings to you from the Greek National Commission from UNESCO, who know that you're here. So again, congratulations, and the Slovenian National Commission. Also, John and colleagues here are part of a global network of UNESCO University Chairs. We just want to celebrate the UC of the and the people who contribute to it. So UNESCO's job is to set standards, exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about and is in your recommendations, to convene, to bring people together, to be a global network and to be a laboratory of ideas. And it's there as well to really engage and empower people. So when, for example, with our superb uh, speaker online, absolutely outstanding, but how do you know, how do we know he's not a, a virtual chat GPT creation? <laughs> well, we know because of the quality of what he's saying, we know that, but in 10 years, will we know? So let's, let's see. Um, also on John's point, um, we need companies. We're all using things bought by companies, but their driver in so many places is, of course, profit. So does a company that wants to make as much money as possible have your interests at, at heart? So when John is talking about not-for-profit and the need for regulation, it's that balance, isn't it, to, to get things right? And if Tim Berners-Lee had charged for the internet, I'm not really sure whether we would be having this discussion right now. Um, and then lastly, because we want to hear from you and your recommendations, um, media literacy, media understanding, understanding what this all means. So this point around these algorithms, when you're applying for a job, what if you don't know the key words that don't get you over the first hurdle? What if there's a bias against the Greek language? Because so much of this stuff is being done in English, Mandarin, other languages. What about language? What about languages in the developing world? Disinformation, we've already spoken about that. Um, so this is about positive things. This is about you making as well the world a better place in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Common Agenda. So let's make it positive. But if we're not really creative and active, there'll be more challenges rather than opportunities. So let's make it about opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. 
and thank you all of the panelists. So um, we'll move now to the next uh, part of the discussion. And uh, this is where the um, winners of the hackathon will present their recommendations. And we have a, a number of different recommendations and the different people are going to present them. What I'm gonna suggest we do is uh, after each uh, short presentation of a recommendation, we open to the panel for thoughts, discussion around that uh, particular recommendation. Uh, it doesn't need to be you know, every panelist responding, but I just thought if we do it that way, we'll have a much more interactive discussion going. And uh, so feel free to jump in, but I'm going to hand over to Corey uh, for the first question. Dear panel members, uh, our topic proposal is addressed to Professor Emily Ellis, but uh, the questions are open to the other members of the panel as well. AI can be a powerful tool if people understand how it works. However, if you do not grasp its underlying principles, you could become a victim of its consequences. One challenge is how to educate users from diverse regional, financial, and social backgrounds. It is important to ensure that the necessary knowledge is not monopolized by a small group of individuals or organizations in order to prevent widening social inequality. We have the following questions. Uh, how can the education system be reformed to prepare students for a world where AI is increasingly prevalent? Now, what skills will be necessary to succeed in such a world? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I discussed a little bit about our work regarding education. I think that's one of the one of the ways, uh, basically, to ensure that uh, different people from all around the world have access to tools where instead of relying on physical education, which we are going that way actually, the world is going that way, but still there is some work to be done. Instead of relying on having access to an individual uh, being present, developing tools or these type of algorithms that enable people to access this type of uh, educational resources from anywhere in the world. I think that's one mechanism. I think that's very important for to ensure that uh, people from different countries have access to this type of uh, resources, but also, for example, women or uh, at home, and maybe they cannot really physically travel uh, or. Uh, People who have with, with dis uh, disabilities, for example, from their home, they can get the training required. And the types of report, uh, the, the types of trainings as well, like we need to ensure that we develop more and more materials that are related to AI to ensure that anyone uh, can access and, and more curricular as well. Because quite often the question is, what do I need to know? Where do I start from? And having this type of resources online in a very accessible way, and AI can help that. AI itself can help break the uh, AI uh, uh, for the world. And uh, we can use these type of approaches to basically help people guide them through the steps, all the steps required uh, uh, to go through starting from basic uh, to the advanced material. And since we are talking about training here, I think another sort of training is uh, also for the engineers who develop the AI algorithms. So that's one, another thing I want to, I would like to emphasize here because a lot of the engineers they know how to develop the algorithms, but fairness, for example, and to ensure that uh, inclusion, these are these have not been the focus of uh, engineering uh, until recently. Now there is a bit more focus on this, but also companies and developers of the algorithms uh, themselves have to be educated. I think to ensure that more people. Uh, more uh, these resources or uh, education is more inclusive, uh, for instance. And uh, there was one more question, I think. Um, uh, uh, yeah. uh, what skills will be necessary to succeed in such a way? I think AI is so broad at the moment. So before, if you ask this question maybe 10 years ago, I would have had math, statistics, but AI is not just math statistics. You see the topics covered here, social sciences, for example, psychology, human computer interaction. These are all different components of AI. So, and it is great because it's inclusive. Like I'm sure there will be a topic related to AI, a topic that you're interested in, and uh, that will be related to AI because AI is now everywhere. So, uh, of course, mathematics, statistics, and uh, machine learning, these type of uh, topics as well. Uh, but in addition to that, I think more uh, psychology, 
uh, sociology, and I believe we need more and more of that, and also interaction, like intersection of these disciplines. I think knowledge where you have both, for example, knowledge of psychology and sociology, as well as machine learning. I think these are great skills to acquire. So instead of just focusing on certain subjects, it's interdisciplinary and uh, topics are becoming more and more important. That's great. Um, if I'm, if I may, wonderful question and wonderful set of answers already. Um, John asked me to to to, to step in because uh, it's difficult to 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 manage the sort of uh, digital divide we have. Um, so one set of answers around uh, what do we need for engineers, developers, uh, making sure that the people who are uh, you know uh, with the brass tacks with, with the with the AI um, are also. Um, you know, sort of get their awareness raised. Uh, but then in terms of what are the key skills, we can list a, you know, a, a long set of disciplines, uh, but really the key point that James was making uh, just before you, you, you came in um, about media literacy. And media literacy can mean lots of different things. Let's not forget critical thinking um, and humanities in the sense that the question of um, of our own humanity is really more and more, um, you know, at the heart of, of, uh, of these conundrums. Um, and then the last, perhaps for me, most important point uh, is around digital divide and equity. It's all fine thinking, you know, how to have the perfect data scientist in the most advanced, uh, you know, um, uh, technological uh, privileged <laughs> countries. Uh, but the question of education goes beyond the question of AI, and we have a lot of work to do there as a as a human collective. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. Any other comments? Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, sorry, that was <laughs> okay. So we'll move on. Uh, the next question, uh, sorry, comment or recommendation is from Eugene. Hello. Hello, good morning to everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your time that uh, you spent with us. Um, I, I'm sure everyone's time is uh, precious and valuable, so I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful that you're here with us and we can share our thoughts with us. Uh, my name is Eugene. Um, I'm a computer science uh, student, University of Cyprus. Uh, I'm in my last year in uh, in, uh, in university, and uh, one of our, one of my favorite subjects is uh, cybersecurity and uh, how to secure data online. <clears throat> so uh, the first day our uh, teacher came in the class, he told us that nothing is private; everything is public and open to the internet. So if someone uh, 100 years ago came up with an algorithm, came up with an algorithm that uh, can crack a private message and can uh, solve an enigma code and win the world war, how can, the, uh, how ca how can we trust that an AI um, uh, cannot surpass the intelligence, the methods, and, uh, and everything combined to um, to, uh, to surpass our intelligence and uh, guarantee the data privacy and security. So uh, one our recommendation is that data, data privacy is an increasingly critical concern in the area of artificial intelligence. And as organizations and individuals increasingly rely on it, uh, it's a more an alarming concern. How we're gonna uh, guarantee our data privacy? So, what's your take on this? So, what do you want to do? I'll take a first crack, and probably the colleague on the uh, on the screen might have some thoughts as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, please, if you can't hear me, I don't just I don't normally get someone too quiet, but so <laughs> if I am. So um, so, I mean, absolutely, um, and you'll see the what the EU has GDPR, and the UK is, is publishing a data protection uh, regime as well. Uh, I think Brexit, of course, data privacy is at the forefront of that. I think when we come into the world of artificial intelligence, it's even more crucial because we know that decisions made on the basis of this data, if it's not properly protected, 
um, it can lead to sort of outcomes that we don't we, that we think are perverse. I think, for example, facial recognition technology is uh, a crucial one in that. And you'll be seeing in different countries, the UK, the US, and Europe, different approaches to uh, how uh, things like facial recognition technology can be used. I think the, the question for policymakers, obviously, I, I'm a policymaker, I, I work in government, is how do you balance data privacy and things like innovation? They are, of course, not. Uh, mutually exclusive, you can have both. But for example, different countries fall in different places. The EU, the US, and the UK fall in somewhere in the middle. So I think you know, when, you, when you go back uh, and sort of talk to your policymakers, I think that's one of the things that's really important to bear in mind is how are you balancing those two things where you'll talk to your expert stakeholders or talk to businesses for one thing, talk to, for example, civil society, third sector, they might say something else. I think it's, it's, a, it's a great point. I really agree, but it's sort of a challenge back as well. Yeah. If I may, I would like to hear the uh, James Zoros uh, take on this. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, the, thank you so much, Eugene. Uh, super interesting uh, question, and I, I uh, totally agree with, with the important points made by Jack just a moment ago. Um, the, the there is, and rightfully so, uh, a great deal of attention on data, um, and you know the GDPR is part of this. The Data Governance Act uh, is another part of the Future Data Act. Uh, so th there's there's a, a flurry of uh, regulatory activity because you're absolutely right. This is a key uh, issue, a key concern, um, and the the recommendation um, you know in, in in the report uh, is very well formulated in in that respect. Just um, as a constructive you know sort of. Uh, conversation. Um, we have to be wary of, of um, measures that are at the that are very much end of pipe. It's important to also take into account the possibility that people might not want their data to be used for um, AI applications in the first place. There's a big um, sort of interesting conversation around this in terms of um, uh, generative AI in the area of uh, pictures, drawing, art, illustrations, where um, <laughs> we're basically saying, okay, now we've trained uh, our, um, you know, our uh, our model. Uh, you can at this point uh, be named or choose to opt out. It all comes just too late, which is why um, it's important with the with the other. Um, suggestions and recommendations that you have in your report to, to, to have flanking measures around a broader upstream conversation on what type of data use do we want uh, in, in various AI models um, and also on where are we going with this just to avoid a situation where um, um, let's say innovators or companies may try to uh, generate roll out of certain products on the market without any proper reflection, without any collective deliberation. That very deliberation that you uh, so importantly call upon in the recommendations. So really a huge thanks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, one question I have in mind uh, that came up right now is that uh, the AI assistance is very accessible nowadays. And um, the the usage and the, the data we get from it is uh, really helpful to us but it, we find it like the quick solution and uh, the quick getaway to find uh, a solution to a problem uh, do you think that uh, in the in the next few years is going to affect this to the future workers that we rely uh, today as much as uh, for quick fixes and quick solutions. Okay, super interesting. And I'm sure uh, my fellow uh, panelists will, will have things to say on this. Um, we have to be wary of uh, simple uh, framings of AI com is coming to take our jobs. Um, <laughs> there are graver concerns about the different forms of capitalism at play in our societies uh, without AI uh, that we, we uh, that we should you know give a proper think to. Um, however, for sure, 
new technologies have a multiplier effect. So if there are biases in society, uh, if there are inequalities, injustices in our societies, and we don't do anything about them, and we just want uh, to you know, add more tech to it, uh, that won't cut it. So, so yes, the, the, there is amazing potential. There are amazing opportunities. Um, I think the, the key point there is the one uh, Jack made earlier, which is that we shouldn't see um, fundamental rights and innovation as in a trade-off, but really devise and design technologies that allow to um, foster fundamental rights as well as uh, tackle global challenges that we face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Um, by the way, if you're interested in asking a question, either from in the room or online, there is a, a system where you can upload a question and uh, we will be moving to questions from the audience and from those listening online uh, after we've uh, considered all of the uh, recommendations. But now we'll move on to the next recommendation. Uh, I would ask uh, Irene to come forward to speak about the multi uh, hello everyone, my name is Irene. Thank you for being here today with us and spending your time with us. Uh, I have studied applied physics. Now I work as a medical engineer in Siemens and I am currently doing my master's degree in AI in the University of Cyprus. Uh, one of the recommendations we would like to talk about is regarding the multic stakeholders approach because AI and technology in general is a very powerful tool and we, we think we should be, uh, everyone should have access to this powerful tool and we would like to know what are the next steps that we can do in order to achieve this. Everyone can answer my question. <laughs> Thank you, um, what a brilliant question. And linking it to um, colleagues and uh, Jim's point about the, the digital divide, um, and the multiplier effect, you can uh, clearly see why a multi-stakeholder approach is essential to get this right. My point as well around, I, I wouldn't be surprised, I don't know, but if you're doing, you're probably doing a lot of your work in English rather than Greek, mm -hmm. and it's things like this is, an, is another thing that's going to be a really big issue um, for people if they don't have the uh, education in order to engage. Secondly, um, on the point as well around fundamental rights and getting this balance right with innovation, there's no doubt innovation can create so many jobs and we're only able again to have the benefit of, of, of Jim and all of you using your phones and filming through technology that's created a massive amount of, of jobs. But a really key thing as well is principles, is having the principles to drive this through those stakeholders around the kind of things that are set out really well in the Sustainable Development Goal. 17 Sustainable Development Goals give a really good framework to achieve a really effective balance. And another one that's really interesting is when, let's say, Jim's work through a legal framework of the EU member states is essential, and it's it's tough stuff, it's law, it's the real, it's the real quite hardball stuff, and it, but it has allowed extraordinarily people to own their own data, which leads a little bit to the previous question, and owning your own data is so key because that's a that's a commodity. So then on multi-stakeholder, I'm taking this through to UNESCO, which is 193 countries, most of the world. I remember a Dutch professor saying something like, he was doing all this work, and then he came to UNESCO and he said, oh, what I was doing was the stamp, but there was a big envelope that existed beyond the, the stamp in terms of the size. But the UNESCO work in a thing that you might have looked at already called the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence is a recommendation. It's not enforceable, but linked to the stakeholders, there's the space there for all the different countries of the world with different levels of wealth, of the uh, non-governmental organizations, of the companies, and making sure there are the key issues around women and men, gender, race, language. So this framework you say about multi-stakeholders is, is so essential 
And there are these frameworks, so I'd encourage you to look at the recommendation and also the hard law of Jim and the innovation coming from the company and your own um, government. Thank you for your answer. Maybe we should hear something from the UNESCO representative. <laughs> oh, well, uh, so I'm, I'm Miguel Vespray, so I have the sort of domestic stakeholders as well. Um, so yeah, UNESCO is the multi stakeholder, <laughs> so international, and, but it's domestically as well. When we're developing policies, uh, for example, our AI regulation white paper that was done, as you say, so very closely with affected stakeholders. So, of course, that's industry, but it's also academia, civil society as well, to make sure that the final product is something that is, is suitable, but also fundamentally deliverable as well. So, I think it's we can have multi stakeholders internationally, and, and again, the UK has we recently uh, announced our AI standards, which was a way to sort of coordinate development of. Standards rates are international. And again, that's working hand in hand with industry. If you think we're quite they're the prime movers in a lot of development. It's moving away from government towards industry. So absolutely civil society, but we can't forget you know, the, the big techs of the world as well. They're gonna have a lot of influence. And the question is how do you well, how do we as policymakers or industrial organizations, how do we make sure that we're working rowing the same way as it were? Thank you very much for your answer. Yeah, I mean, I agree uh, with all the previous, uh, previous things. Uh, and I think regarding this, uh, ensuring that uh, everyone is uh, basically aware of the importance of this and is involved in policy making, I think it's important. It looks like it's already being done, but the policy makers have the responsibility to make sure that uh, every, like, different people who are involved and who are affected, as well as who are involved in the design of these systems are involved in the final policy making and if that's one to come out I want to make it straight that there is awareness regarding that. Thank you very much. It's really great to hear that we are taking steps forward in this direction. Thank you so much for your time. Um, next question actually maybe uh, is a nice uh, sequence uh, to this multi-stakeholder um, question, and that is around education more broadly for critical thinking. Uh, so I'd ask Tassos. Hello, everyone. My name is Tassos Vemos, and I come from Greece. Um, I would like to, I had a different question in mind when I was writing this, but following what we're, we're discussing now, I would like to come on Jim's uh, point of uh, point and talk more about the ownership of data and the monetization of data. But since we are not uh, clear on the ownership, it's kind of hard to move on the monetizations, but I would like to uh, hear your thoughts about this. Uh, yeah, so do you have any ideas of how uh, data should be monetized? Who gets paid to when? Uh, these engines like ChatGPT is uh, used. How can we know that uh, people wrote uh, the, the paper, were citing, and all that stuff? Uh, Jim, you can. Sure, sure, sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tassa. Super important uh, question, and um, and I want to link it to the the point that uh, Irene was was uh, making earlier about multi stakeholder. Um, the the main thing is, um, you know, one can uh, choose to look at um, things optimistically, or uh, you know, or present more sobering thoughts. Um, a lot <clears throat> is at stake. A lot is at stake with uh, with what is going on uh, around AI now, and there are good reasons to rejoice. Um, the you know the, the point that James was was making just a, a moment ago. Um, in November 2021, the nine, the the 193 members uh, of, of UNESCO uh, at the general conference adopted the UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So, all uh, all member countries together, um, you know, found common ground, uh, and uh, in an area where one might have thought, oh no, but the the divisions are too rife. This will there will never be an agreement there. It, it happened. Um, 
and uh, and things uh, around AI that were thought to be unregulatable. Uh, more and more in different uh, policy contexts, there are ways that 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 are uh, found to do so. Uh, moving now closely to to the the specific question you asked about ownership of data and monetization of data. Um, just five, 10 years ago, we were living in a world where huge corporations were just um, scooping off <laughs> you know, uh, people's data, um, accruing stupendous benefits out of it. Um, and, and that was it. And they were thought to be untouchable, untaxable even. Uh, but things have evolved quite substantially. Um, so when we talk about um, media literacy or data literacy, uh, critical thinking. Uh, it's precisely about that. It's asking those tough questions, looking at the world as it is and asking, wait, can we do better? Uh, does it really have to be this way? Um, and so this is, I think, why the, uh, the initiative that uh, you know, the British Council and the different partners have, have led involving you in, in this process of um, empowerment, in a sense, uh, taking ownership, not of the data, but of your fate as young people in this, uh, you know, in, in, the, in this world that can be changed is, is so, so crucial. Um, so yes, I believe that um, if we do things right collectively, um, there will be a fairer relation with uh, individual group and collective data, it is perfectly possible to, to do so. Uh, and then questions around, um, you know, fair allocation of burdens, costs, risks, and benefits uh, will come to the fore. Yes. Thank you very much. Any other thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I thought that was terrific, Jim, and what a brilliant question, um, along with the other brilliant questions. Um, so really key to all this, first thing is Jim, I love Jim's point around um, optimism and the future and you owning it, you know, you are the people that will be deciding where this all goes and you already are through your work, which is also really inspiring. Accountability is absolutely key. There must be the mechanisms of accountability. If there are not those mechanisms, it will go wrong always and that's to do with human beings that's been the same for thousands of years and there's been great struggles to get us where we are now with our democratic systems and legal systems and freedom of the press etc so on the point about intersectoral that's where it all comes together it's all coming together again the sdgs education science um, and uh, culture for example the second thing is to do with freedom, your freedom. So in order for there to be accountability, there has to be regimes of freedom and democracy. Because if you're in an authoritarian regime, imagine you're the leader of an authoritarian regime, you might be quite, you know, um, you can do what you want up to a point. What incentive do you have to look after your data? What incentive do you have to make sure that your, that your people are, are doing well? Now, the answer to that often is, so long as they're prosperous, you won't get too much trouble. But that's not good enough. That's top down. It needs to be accountable, accountable uh, mechanisms. And that's why in democratic systems, provided there's a fair balance, you're more likely to have accountability. And I would say that actually the work of, you know, the EU's work is quite extraordinary the way that they've, protect, they've protected people's data. Um, because again, if you're thinking about the tremendous wealth of some of these wonderful corporations, I've got a Google phone here. Um, I hope you enjoy listening to what I'm saying. Um, and, um, but, you know, let's not be, and, and it's by the way, full of inspirational people as well. But some of the mechanisms are very interesting in the way democracy works and accountability mechanisms. These companies, if your company's worth a trillion pound, trillion dollars, a trillion euros, you can hire the best lawyers and lobbyists in the whole world to get what you want. So this is why there must always be accountability, accountability, accountability. And lastly, because we want to hear from the others, you, you spoke about monetization of data. A really extraordinary thing as well is that's so important. 
and I've seen some of the bodies taking steps around that. If you can own it, it splits things over and puts more strength in, in your hand or collective groups, young people's hand, people with less money addresses the digital divide. But another extraordinary thing about it is before the way that economics work, as you know, and actually Greece is famous for its expertise in, in, in it having some of the best economists, is the efficient distribution of scarce, scarce resources. Adam Smith, invisible hand, through, um, uh, through economic market systems. But an extraordinary thing about AI and Alphabet and Meta is they have so much data, they have so much information that you start to ask some interesting questions about, is the information they have superior to the information you can get through market systems? That can be very, very interesting. We don't even know where that's all going to go. And of course, you can imagine it will be combining the two, which would be the super powerful thing. So there's some extraordinary questions for us. Thank you. Go to Thank you. I just want to add to that um, more regarding the previous point about privacy and innovation. We discussed a bit about the trade off between them. And I think it's very related to this topic as well, because for many years, especially the, after the scandal, for example, Cambridge Analytica and the uh, other related things, the society became much more aware about the importance of their data and privacy of the data. And uh, there has been all this reaction, in a sense, uh, of people than uh, companies making use of their data. It was seen possibly as a bad thing, for example. And I think the solution to that is actually users getting the ownership of their data and monetizing uh, their data possibly. Because uh, there is a trade off. If the data is seen as a too private and if individuals are too scared to share their data possibly, it would also block innovation because AI algorithms currently highly rely on data. And of course, your data is valuable also to provide better things for you, get better informed source of information to you as well. So there is that trade off. And I think the solution is really to make sure that people are aware of the importance of their data, take their ownership of their data, and uh, think that it is a, a thing that they could monetize possibly. And this is possible for by better training. So that people know the power of them instead of being scared that like okay my my data is mine type of approach knowing that their data is a value and if they want they can they should they have the option to keep it to themselves but sharing it and enabling ai or algorithms to use it is also not that a bad thing as long as it is done properly where regulations are placed and in place to make sure that their data is not misused and as long as the users are aware how their data is being used so I think this issue about data ownership and monetization is very important as individuals have to be made more aware of the potential harms, but also positive uh, of the, the usage of their data. And also that would enable, uh, for example, democratizing access to data, as was mentioned before, a lot of large companies do have access to the, these data resources, but if individuals had more ownership or they were able to monetize their data, maybe other companies or other smaller, small scale companies who don't have these data sets would also uh, flourish and uh, it would basically lead to lots of new businesses as well. So that trade off there, I think is very important and educating individuals and uh, uh, which was which is related, very related to the question and making sure that everyone is aware of these trade offs and the power of their data and how to monetize their data. What are the regulations? These are very important and for the future of AI as well. Well, uh, well, I was actually going to ask you to ask your original question, if that's okay, but uh, you can ask a, yeah. another question. Yeah, so uh, do you have any like more um, concrete ideas of how ownership could be established for uh, like, uh, I don't know, people who make art, for example, because we spoke about uh, the art movement that people want to have their ownership about the, the work. I think it was very quick. The, the expertise for a lot of these things in the UK is held within, for example, the regulators. So, you know, the Intellectual Property Office, they have experts, technical experts, who can answer these questions. Uh, if it's related to art, related to something else, it really has a different regulator. So, yeah, my suggestion based on the UK approach is to empower your experts within your institutions 
to answer to, to decide these questions themselves. Rather than having a one size fits all approach, uh, it, it, yeah, this is sort of the approach the UK is taking, making sure that your experts have made the decision. You can set policy, set direction from the sensor, but a lot of the expertise is held in different places. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to ask your original question? question? It, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. It, it was kind of covered, so that's why okay. I, I think. Okay. No Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, yeah. So absolutely very great question. And of my life I've wasted and struggling hundreds <laughs> of that. That's um, I think obviously you've jumped to legislation as your answer. I guess yes. my challenge would be is legislation the right answer? A couple of questions to think of. One is your overall approach, top down versus bottom up. So obviously you your so legislation is a top down approach. It's you know, got the MPs uh, sort of setting the, the rule. Um, couple questions for you there. Are MPs the right people to be doing that when they come to the album? Do they have the technical understanding? And you'll what you might find, I think this is a very live question in the US when people talk about it, mm -hmm. is it'll take know, a year to get a bill through Parliament or unless of course they're rushing it through, but or whatever. By that point, is it even in date anymore? Are, are, the, are the laws that it sets out even relevant because the state of the art has moved on in that year? That's one question. The other is, of course, what is your country like? What is the political makeup of your country? So I know, for example, in China, they limited sort of the use of ten cents, something like that, or, or you know, fortnight to ninety minutes mm -hmm. a day, um, yeah. because that's the political environment that you can do it in China. Whereas in the UK, in the US, and in Europe, I can't imagine a law like that being passed, just because again, different political makeup. So that's top-down, and then bottom-up approach. Uh, how it, you know, is sort of perhaps the suggestion I would make is how you're empowering. Uh, of how you're empowering the users of social media to make these decisions yourself. So you can reflect on why you sort of cut the cause <laughs> with the whole turkey on social media. How did you come to that decision? And then I'm sure there'd be a lot of similar themes with other users as well. And how can you empower policymakers to sort of spread that best practice uh, to other users? So I think it's a, I haven't given you an answer there. It's just a lot of questions. So okay. going through, but it's, it's absolutely the right question to ask. But the approach, I think, is is very complex and got a lot of options how to take it through. It really is. Um, well, I really jumped that my limit of use of social media, as in, I don't know, being so flabbergasted, I guess, from all the like stimuli I was getting, and I really didn't see any way out of it, other than just to just cut ties with it uh, altogether. But I, I was hoping that. Maybe there would be some legislation to. Well, did you address that by like saying how state of the art everything is and how you really can keep up with it? To just go into the core of it and kind of break break those algorithms that you know make it so rewarding, such a reward experience. But I guess that's very hard, and uh, it really has to do about uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's really impressive what, what, what you've done. Yeah. And, um, and it was really hard. And, but, <laughs> it was really hard. <laughs> and it's also classic, isn't it, that technology is going way ahead of legislation. It, it always happens. It's always happened and always will happen. But also there is hope and there is uh, a really positive element of all this because actually, again, the humans don't change. The humans don't change. Um, and that means that the core principles, if you can stick to those principles and get that right, you can actually predict what's going to happen. We know in the past that addiction is a thing that then leads to all sorts of complications. So we know uh, that the core human, the human beings are the same and therefore it's not um, you know that phrase, it's not rocket science, it kind of is rocket science, or it's AI, AI science to get this right, but the humans haven't changed, and that's why I'm incredibly optimistic that we can do it. I mean, I can confess with your uh, amazing step is, for example, I find myself like Jack scrolling through, and what I've done is I actually, for example, I will um, delete the social media app, but then I realise I'm missing out on communication that I want to have and I reinstall it and that's what I do I deliberately do that so that it will take me time and trouble to reinstall mm -hmm. it but if I want it enough I'll do it it's not I don't recommend doing it <laughs> but, um, so you know I, I'm, I'm with you but you've taken a more a more yeah. a more radical a more radical step and um, so just to bring it back though media literacy if you really understand this if we really understand what's going on what the companies uh it, 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 this isn't about blaming companies it's about the, the model and then this links doesn't it as well to accountability because if your profit model is selling advertising you want people to be watching it all the time and what does that it's things that's like a little injection of some kind of stimulating drug 
And then this can lead to all kinds of complications, including in democratic systems. We've witnessed that in some countries recently. So again, there is a opportunity for this. And you know, the Romans, the thing they'd say about Rome 2000 years ago, bread and circuses, bread and circuses. Well, again, you know, is it really that complicated to predict that humans are going to be drawn in with some new form of bread and circuses? I don't think it is. And therefore, I'm really optimistic that we can find ways and then you will be able to reinstall your ah, social media. Yeah. Hallelujah. And yeah. I will not have to do such stupid things like having to put mine in and out in and out. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just want to put on in this weird way, I don't know if I'm but um, with social media addiction, there's a really great talk by one of the ex YouTube people mm -hmm. um, where he talks about how it's, it's also, it radicalizes people because to get that injection, but you watch one video, but the next one has to be slightly more interesting or a shoot, and then you keep clicking on that recommended video, and then you're on maybe like some far right propaganda of YouTube. And he explains that that's it's not a bug, it's essentially a feature. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get out it's put on YouTube, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, although, yeah, don't kill me. Yeah, so you mentioned that you go ahead, you go ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll come in after. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, does some AI algorithms used in these platforms, they are optimized for something like user engagement or stickiness, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. You do want to make the, these platforms engaging. And of course, the more engaging you become, the more addictive possible, possibly they should become. So there is a trade off there between user engagement and addiction. And same for the design, that they are intentionally designed in such a way that they get your attention and uh, even these all design content are personalized so that you you personally are more uh, interested in in the things that are visualized or in the way that are presented there. Uh, so that's maybe one thing to think about. Of course, in terms of regulation, uh, it is possible. It's very understandable that these platforms would want their platforms to be engaging. But then, what is the objective that they are optimizing for? Maybe it is like oh, we have been talking about, for example. And monitoring fairness and this is another aspect maybe we have this monitoring has to be done by experts what are the targets or what are the objectives in designing these ai algorithms and the regulation should be very careful design with respect that and it may not be too difficult it may not be just about the objective that is used to train uh, these models it may be also just the, the design of these models for example they they it may be as simple as these models giving you a warning like okay maybe you should stop mm -hmm. or telling you how much time you spend it may be as simple as that but there is definitely more work that needs to be done in terms of yeah. setting up these regulations very fast i really see that being the case because i also have figured out a way of my phone making uh, you know uh warning you there's a way to do that of how much like time is going to miss you have beat you and i have done that but what I found myself doing is I, I kept expanding that time frame. So <laughs> go to like half an hour, five minutes, to an hour, and now we're going to end up with four hours in the recent and scrolling. Now, yeah, maybe the warning should tell you more about that. Hey, you are becoming more addicted. Maybe that have to <laughs> yes, maybe that will save you. Yeah, because in, in a sense, uh, so the, the conversation we're having now. Uh, ties in the different um, questions that we've we've uh, considered together. Um, if the business model is one of attention economy, surveillance economy, data scooping, micro-targeted advertising, and the platforms and apps are designed to, to addict, to ensure that you spend as much time uh, every day on, on them, um, in a sense, it's all wrong. Uh, but it's um, but then one can look at it from the perspective of um, you know, the user, what can I do? I, I know this is terrible, what can I do? It's very reasonable to uh, stop using the app or just delete it from, from your phone or device. Um, can we do better? Can we collectively do better than to have this choice between something that's designed to be toxic uh, and just having to stop using it? And, and this is where um, you, your starting point of thinking about addiction is really useful. Um, in the way that um, different societies at different points in time have de dealt with alcohol, for instance, prohibition was tried. It's really bad. It, it, it had very poor results. Um, so it's not about legislating the users and telling them, you can't use this, it's prohibited. Um, 
in that sense, it would be more about, okay, how can we have a culture of critical thinking, media literacy, responsible use? Um, but then we also need to think about how to legislate the platforms themselves. Um, you know, a, the typical alcohol that people have is uh, ethanol, but if you have methanol, then it just kills you. It kills you like really quickly. Um, and so certain substances in perfectly legit uh, alcohol bottles are forbidden. There are certain things that are just too toxic to be, uh, to be allowed. Of course, it's, you know, letting people choose. But if something is really gonna kill you straight off the bat, it's not a good idea to let it happen. Um, and so um, this is where there's more than, it, it's, it's more than just legislating the problem away. Uh, it's also thinking about the users. It's also thinking about the ecosystem, about the, the business models, about really the question of what world, what society uh, do we want? However, if one looks specifically, you know, at the sort of the thin end of the wedge, which is legislation, then um, the Data Services Act and the Data Markets Act are, you know, are, are doing their part of, of, the, of the job. Uh, they aim to create a safer digital space where the fundamental rights of users are protected and to establish a level playing field for businesses to avoid a sort of um, oligopoly, monopoly. Um, so, so yes, just to offer a few more considerations. Thanks again. Thank you. Really, just an idea popped into my head as you were speaking, uh, of possibly a way of uh, trying to limit users' uh, addiction in social media. What if there would be like a little color indicator of possibly like AI driven technologies behind it that would scan and kind of uh, come out with a toxicity level? <laughs> well, maybe like, yeah, you have the color indicator and it would be green if it was like, you know, say orange if it, would, if it was kind of being like going into toxicity and red if you, you know, to have really like strong comments uh, about it. Maybe that would be a way of, you know, me seeing like the trade, I'm not gonna interact with it at all. Green, possibly, yeah, of course. And orange, I would think about it a little bit before I'd you know, be a little bit more cautious. I think that would be a fun idea, but you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting to get the question to you, mate. It's called uh, Green. Yeah, well, that's why I mentioned AI. Yeah, maybe this is what I think the approach to how people play their own decisions mm -hmm. is better than top down, for example, what the UK thinks is orange or red would be different from mm -hmm. or different. So Europe, different from other countries. We want to avoid government overreach in some mm -hmm. areas and be empowering people to make decisions themselves, giving them the information by their own uh, their own call. This whole discussion really <laughs> shows how multi uh this whole problem is. But I am I am optimistic. Yes. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. thank you very much. So we've uh, come to the end of the presentations from the uh, uh, hackathon winners. Um, I have one question online, but I think there was go a ahead. question. No, 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 go ahead. ahead. We, 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 we were first. <laughs> I think I'm here. Sorry, yeah. I think that will be it. I'm afraid your question was <laughs> <happy online. laughs> Um I think a lot of questions came up in the process of you responding, but I think that uh, an important one was if we took a shot every time you mentioned AI, we would all be drunk. So we utilize that word a lot. It's a word that sells. Uh, it is a phrase that has been used excessively since December when Chad GPT. I arrived um, in London curious uh, on the flight, how many times will Chad GPT come up? And how much do people actually understand and how the model works and its misuse? You had also, also mentioned earlier that you're focusing a lot on companies driving a lot of the research because government research is not keeping up uh, as well as the companies. And that's probably because there's a lot more money in the industry than in government research. How do we protect our societies and formulate legislation where it is needed top down to protect the way that our everyday lives are? So if we start automating a lot of our everyday tasks, what do we do? Do you set a monthly stipend that you give people because their job was overtaken? 
And how do you let that research be driven by industry? Industry has an incentivization to continue profiting. So is that the way where we will let businesses drive our policy in the future because our government and research is not keeping up? And how do you protect people from the misuse of the term? Uh, there was a, a governmental statement that was let out by the State Department earlier on Monday as to check yourself before you mention artificial intelligence. How many people can really define what AI is? Do I just have a loop that's automated and I call it AI suddenly? Because some people are. And how do you protect people from that? Is that industry or is that government? Lots of questions, but I think, yeah, I appreciate your, your time and processing my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last three massive fundamental questions about the future of the 21st century. So I, I, I don't think we're going to ask it. I think um, the obvious way I would say, I think, is yeah, absolutely. In, you know, now, we ask 10 different people, we get 10 different definitions. I think the way we look at it is about automation and kind of adaptability. Sort of, you look at principles of what the technology does, then you can, you can cast into sort of bucket where maybe this is more like an AI than others. But other people may have different takes on it on this panel, which is really interesting. Um, on industry overtaking government, uh, it is money. I mean, it's something like this was that 90% of the industry. So the question is, government won't be able to overtake. How do we take advantage of what they're doing? So how do we set the rules of the road? So that, for example, when they're developing these technologies, they're not getting ahead of themselves. They're not rushing out. Uh, they're now going before it's been tested properly, which is, we have seen that before. Um, or how do you give them safe spaces to do things like that? How do you create things like regulatory sandboxes where they can be experimental because that is what leads to innovation? Again, I'm not, these aren't answers. These are sort of conflicting principles that, that or, or approaches the government has to decide. I, I would extend on that. What if when nuclear weapons were focused, we're a private company and you let the private company say, I'm making my own state. I am alphabet and I will be a government. How do you protect the world from a company claiming to be a government if you're researching the Yeah, I mean, so I don't have the answer that well. I think uh, New Group is a very interesting um, example. Perhaps we would say that, you know, we may not want to draw that exact comparison. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't have the answer to that. No, one. no I worries. Right. I think it's it's the, the international organizations amongst us might have a different <laughs> answer to all the research on that very And just on that last point on, on protecting where, where things like automation come in. Okay, that's about reskilling, upskilling people. Um obviously UBI, you know, basically come with the live question. Um I think it's for making sure that people can take new jobs. So think, uh, the UK government's invested a lot in making sure that people have a lifelong learning entitlement so they can uh, upskill if the you know, Whatever reason, but it's putting attention to I've talked a lot of stuff. I'm happy to come in if, you, if you'd like. Um, in terms of the uh, the sort of the, the red thread of your excellent set of uh, questions, which are around um, what do we mean by AI, the definition of, of AI. Um, it's, I mean, uh, it's interesting to look, you can look at it historically, see how the definition has evolved, uh, this paradox about AI, that it's always the next thing. Things which are uh, now seem perfectly fine, like optical character recognition, which we would never call AI, were the cutting edge uh, a few decades ago and were called AI. If only we could get the machine to recognize the characters of it, great. Um, so that, there is, the, this is the first point that needs to be made is that um, historically it has been fluid. Um, and I'm not talking here about, uh, you know, AI winters and so on, but just by the question, what do we mean by AI? Uh, evidently, the types of um, algorithms that came into this definition have evolved because new ones uh, have come in. Um, there's another set of remarks that could be developed around hype hype and hubris and the very fact that calling something AI uh, makes it more uh, exciting, maybe for the public, surely for venture capitalists in, in some contexts. Um, but then to be really concrete, in different um, pieces of uh, legal text, they, there, are, there have been different definitions of, of AI. Sometimes it was 
um, uh, not necessary to define uh, what AI is. But if you're thinking about the AI Act, so it's a it's a piece of uh, legislation of regulation that intends to uh, say you know, to, to to regulate AI. Surely there you must you must somehow say what you're talking about. Otherwise, there is no chance to to achieve the the aim. Um, and and this is the point I was making earlier about uh, this sort of uh, interesting generative tension between. Uh, looking at specific sectors, specific tech application use cases. And then if you want to have a, a, a form of regulation that applies across the board, um, the way that this has been done is precisely by um, having a typology. Because not all AI is created the same. Uh, because as we see in the case of, of uh, ChatGPT, uh, th those, you know, those, those not, I'm just, I'm not talking only about uh, general purpose natural language processing uh, task solvers and, and content generators, but, but more generally, you know, like general purpose AI, generative AI, um, it, in a sense, <laughs> it depends what you use it for. So you can say, okay, this is AI, but if you want to uh, regulate it, if you want to say, this is fine, you know, it, it doesn't matter, or this is really dangerous, this can really have terrible implications, um, you need to have more of a casuistic typological approach. And this is what uh, the AI Act tries to do. So those are different elements uh, for your consideration. And thanks so much again for this excellent question. Thanks, Jean. Any, any other comments? Yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to perhaps regard this question about industry, academia. I think that's a great question. And we do see it in academia uh, quite a bit, even the research that we do. Of course, we are restricted by the compute resources that we have, or we have. We don't have the same data set as the industry. Lately, I see more and more uh, people working, having these joint appointments between the industry and academia. Of course, that does enable this uh, the know-how from the industry to move to academia, and vice versa, of course. And also to ensure possibly that the, the research is done within the industry is not a like, secret or black box that is here, because of course there are, there are academics working with these uh, companies. And, so that's one way, and I think these type of positions are becoming increasingly popular. And another possible direction that I was thinking is maybe to have more uh, unit, like several institutions, several universities, several academic institutions get together and form big centers so that they can also compute with these type of large corporations where you more funding, more powerful compute resources, and of course data is important and uh, with people getting ownership of the data, democratizing access to data, I think that's also critical because it's one of the blockers at the moment, actually, in for lots of researchers. If you don't have access to data to train the, the algorithm, you are again very limited. So, the regulations around that, and uh, hopefully in the next few years, it, become, it, be, it becomes easier to get hold of this type of data set. I think that's very important. Of course, these companies, but there may be some regulations to ensure that they share data sets, they share compute resources, blah, blah, all the algorithms. Of course, that's another uh, important dimension of this. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. And another aspect I wanted to uh, discuss a bit about is regarding jobs, skills of people. I think uh, the type of skills required uh, after things like ChatGPT or the AI algorithms, they are changing. I don't see that as a, like, as a bad thing in the sense that people will lose their jobs. I think people just have to learn different skills. So now, of course, there is a problem here. People, how they have the skills required. So there will be different types of trainings and educational programs that needs to be developed to ensure that people in the society can keep up and, to, and educate themselves to, to make sure that their skill levels are still the ones that are on demand, for example. And with the usage of AI, it's actually uh, one of the things, advantages of AI uh, instead of drawbacks is that with AI taking over the more repetitive tasks, people can take over more creative tasks. So there may be possibilities to open up new job opportunities and this type of creative thinking will become a lot more important. So as a whole, it will still guide the society in a positive direction with people focusing on more creative tasks and uh, that maybe in 10 years ago, we didn't have time to focus on. So moving the society ahead uh, uh, through the help of AI, I think uh, will be the way that we will be seeing the society going as opposed to like society staying backwards because they 
most yeah. skilled and they don't have the jobs. Can I have a counter argument for that? How do we handle um how do we ha handle the equity among that? So if I am a mother of kids and I have my little iRobot that cleans my floors and I have something doing my dishes, I have something delivering food for me, and I have time to be creative, but I can afford to purchase that machine that gives me another three hours in my day. But what if I'm a mother that cannot afford that machine and I am a single mom, I still have to run the kids, and I still need to work for those additional three hours. How do we make sure that artificial intelligence, as it makes more creative, doesn't make a small class of people more creative and keeps the burden on other classes? And it's a theoretical, we can talk about it for hours, but I'm not fully convinced that that will look good. That's a very good question. I think that's related to what we discussed to ensure that everyone has access to these type of systems. Uh, over time, of course, they will get cheaper. And yes, at the beginning, maybe only certain individuals will have access to them, but in five, 10 years, so now maybe more and more uh, parts of the society we have access to these systems. So over time, it, it will it, by itself probably get a bit more fair. But you need, I think that's the concern we have to think about and uh, regulations and uh, through regulations and through creative mechanisms and the industry as well, how to make these devices more accessible should be a focus area for the industry, I agree. Okay, um, is it okay if we move to any more comments or I, Sorry, James. I'll be very brief because no. time's passing. Um, but um, great question, um, and, and I'll, I'll kind of tailor it so we can move yeah. each time. I mean, on your point about research networks, a nice way to make this a bit longer is by saying, well, what about John's UNESCO chair and the global <laughs> network? I mean, this is exactly what we want, isn't it? These links, and absolutely acknowledging the universities also get their grant from the companies as well. I mean, you're an Amazon scholar, aren't you? Yeah. So, you know, you can see how this can, can be made to work. Um, so I think that's very promising. Promising to keep it quick. I think it's great that you mentioned nuclear, um, but there are, don't forget, controls. You know, countries have got together to control uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons. And then lastly, on those core principles that we have, um, again, something that John and colleagues have worked on and is in the UNESCO recommendation and the EU and UK work. You know, the, the people haven't changed, as I said, the, the religious texts, you know, thou shalt not kill, Hindu texts, Buddhist texts, Islamic texts, Christian texts. And also, um, bit that your, your lovely point about how many people are going to go on about chat GPT, which as you know is currently, you know, we're saying where's it going to be in 10 years, it's pretty dumb at the moment. If you put in something now about Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, put it in, there's nothing. That's because the data set doesn't reach the 24th of February 2022, which perfectly illustrates your point around data sets. It's not even in there. So that tells you a really big story. And the fashions move on, don't they, John? So do you remember everyone was going on about nanotech and then they're going on about genetic engineering and Bitcoin? You know, the time is going to come when no one's going to be talking about AI in this way, but it will still all be happening and all these other things are all happening. So that's why it's so important to get it right. To you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, so uh, we are over time, but um, I feel duty bound we should ask this last question if everyone can bear with us for another five minutes, perhaps. Um, uh, so this really is an interesting question. I'll read it as, as stated. Search engines and social networking sites generate vast amounts of standardized data uh, that is highly predictive of relevant outcomes. By contrast, social impact sectors such as education and health comprise hundreds or thousands of organizations, local authorities, hospitals, schools, each collecting small, incomplete, and disconnected data sets. A rush to test AI innovation in the social sectors without meaningful data could cost lives if done incorrectly. Yet, protecting people's personal data is, quite rightly, central to this debate, so joining them up may be hard. What are the practical steps needed to bridge this gap? <laughs> Uh, I can come in perhaps. Um, I mean, so uh, thank you so much. It's a really important question, really interesting. It dovetails with some of the, the, the points we, we discussed earlier. Um, and uh, as the, you know, as the colleague who's asking that question uh, is careful to, to ensure, um, 
we should not, uh, you know, say it's either, um, you know, far west data uh, system, um, <laughs> or it's a, uh, uh, or we have no innovation. It's it, the the uh, the the high stakes are really about how to ensure that we do have high quality data sets. Uh, that can be used not by just uh, a handful of companies who have monopolized the data um, and that are fully um, respectful of, of fundamental rights. So um, this takes work. It takes um, you know, sitting together at the table. It takes a, a robust regulatory framework. It, just, it doesn't happen just like that. Uh, but it is crucial to, to ensure this. Um, again, there is the thin end, end of the wedge quoting pieces of legislation, uh, which I've done already and which, you know, so this is part of the, part of the thinking. Um, but then there are um, broader questions um, with regard to, to the conversation we're, we're having now or the conversation we're having uh, two minutes ago. We can't just think about AI in isolation, because otherwise we, we run into the problem of, um, you know, the single parent with the three kids without the means to, um, and then we say, oh yeah, but if we, uh, if we design some really good AI, then it will solve the problem, not quite. Um, so this is why we, we have to think bigger, think laterally as well. Uh, think about questions of equity, and this can lead into questions around universal basic income. Um, if we if we if we work less, um, and if we work more unequally, then we may need to start um, to think about decoupling all the things that are strangely bundled under the concept of work. Um, income, uh, what you do with your time, how you see yourself, an important component of, of your identity, social status. All of those, all of those things that are uh, access to social security. How odd that all of this would be would come together under work, but um, with a, a set of digital technologies that can be grouped under AI or not, um, we have uh, an opportunity and really an obligation to rethink these. So questions around free distribution, redistribution uh, of, uh, of of wealth, how we organize our our uh, our lives, um, how do we um, make good on the promises of justice and solidarity uh, in our societies. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Jim. Any other comments? Uh, I, don't I think there are some companies who are looking into this issue around data. How do you how do you make sure that basically the business model is let's say you have a company who's looking for certain data sets? How do you make sure that uh, you find correct people? You connect this company with the people so that people get ownership of the data data and they can monetize their data and the company has access to their data. There are businesses that are forming around this lately. Of course, these companies have to be highly regulated and there are issues around privacy. So this has to be done in a very careful way, but that's one direction. I know in medical research, for example, people can donate their data. There are institutions that are forming where, uh, for example, MRI scans and so on, it's very difficult to find these type of data sets, as mentioned before. But there are centers that uh, ask where you can donate your data and they collect this data together and make it accessible to people or to researchers working in this area so that uh, the, the researchers have access to much larger data sets than their individual uh, institutions, uh, the, data, uh, the, the data sets their individual institutions have access for. So these type of things that are happening, and of course, there is the other, other end where these large corporations could also, or the few companies that have access to, that have most of the data. There is some work there. They try to uh, set infrastructure to share data set. Of course, there were very negative examples before. And uh, that set things a bit backwards. And uh, they, there was quite a bit of hesitation in data sharing as well, because privacy is a concern, of course, the data uh, you have to make sure that when you share the data and make it public, uh, the privacy of individuals is uh, protected. And uh, there were cases before where this wasn't the case, and uh, that was one issue. I think now there are, the last few years, we see more of this happening. Like I was involved in one data sharing setup where we 
Uh, I work with a very large corporation which was willing to share, make some of their data, their public data. It's a lot of work, both internally and uh, for their legal teams, starting with their legal teams, to their researchers involved, to ensure that privacy of the people are, is preserved, and more legal team is the, like, you are following everything correctly and legally, and so it's a lot of work. I think more incentives may be given to these uh, large corporations. Uh, that's one thing to think about, but there is also some work happening, hopefully with more and more positive examples happening that like that, because there is also, uh, when the company shares the data, lots of researchers start using these data. It's also a positive thing actually for the company, because lots of uh, people think that this company is a place where this type of research is being done, for example. But more incentives like that should probably be given to the industry so that very large data sets and more reliable data sets become more accessible. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the other thought was distributed learning, you know, with mm -hmm. privacy preserving distributed learning, which we are now sharing without privacy. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, unless there are any further comments. I would thank all of the panelists for their really great answers and to the questions um, that we had in the, uh, in the hackathon and from the public. So uh, thank you, everyone, for I think a very interesting and enjoyable debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.